from John, the 13th chapter. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God, went to God, and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Now, the thing that amazes me about this chapter is the knowledge of Jesus and his response to that knowledge. The third verse says, tells us of his knowledge. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, there never was such a person as that on the face of this earth. But remember this, he gave all things into his hands into his hands as the perfect man. And that means that Jesus is a demonstration of our own possibility. He did not give all things and as God, he already had all things. But as man, he sought to demonstrate for us what could be done if we know reality and know who we are. That's a little bit way of saying the same thing. And having, having learned obedience by the things that he suffered, And having finished this demonstration and having walked as man perfectly, proving God at every point, God now puts all things into his hands. In effect, he says, as the perfect man, you you may now do what you will. But I'm not to the knowledge yet. But he had that knowledge. Not only had he given all things into his hands, he gave a man all things. He gave a man that, that, that was not exercising his Godhead. He was not exercising the power of the Godhead. For he did only as his father spoke. He did only what his father said. Except for dying on the cross, he only only did what you and I are able to do if we trust God as perfectly as he did. That's good to know, isn't it? You mean we can walk on water? Yes. Peter did. You mean the power of the universe can be behind our, our life? Yes, yes. Christ became nothing. We are nothing, but he became nothing. And he reached this point in his manhood when in his manhood, not in his godhood, the Father said, in his manhood, you now have all things. 
Do as you will. Now he had all of this, but he had he had this knowledge also that he was come from God and went to God. Now having all things, having proved his manhood, and having proved that God can take care of all things that a man needs, if that man will entirely depend upon him, for he had done that for Jesus. He now, the Bible says that Jesus, I, I suppose that at this point, all these things being placed into his hand, he was now, it was now illuminated. It was upon his mind that he came from God and that he went to God. So he knew who he was. So I wonder what he's going to do with all this. What does a man do when he arrives at some point of knowing who he is? What does a man really do when God puts maybe not all things, but a few things in his hand? What does a man do when he has some knowledge or witness that he's come from God, that he's been sent from God? So we're dealing with Christ's manhood here. Therefore, we can, uh, there's an analogy for us. What do we do if we know that we've been, that we've come from God, that is we've been sent of him and we're going back to him? He came from God in a way that we did not, but we are sent from God. And I'm speaking of this knowledge. He had full knowledge of all the people of the earth. He came from God, and he was going back to God, and now he has all things in his hands. How does he respond to this tremendous knowledge? What kind of demands will he make? What kind of, um, what kind of authority will he ask for? What kind of recognition does he seek? What does he demand? What does he boast of? Well, the the next verse is very surprising, I think. Where God, having put all things in his hands, and with this, and with this, confirming and illuminating knowledge that he's come from God and going to God. He does the most unusual thing. He rises from supper and he laid aside his garments. Didn't put on a collar, did he? He laid aside his garments took a towel, and girded himself. And after that he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. What he did with all of this knowledge was only what a slave in the empire did. He did the nastiest, nastiest, lowliest, basest, thing that was done in the empire, one of the things, and that was wash a man's dirty feet. What he did was assume the work of a slave. I mean a despised, rejected, A slave who has no rights and is not even acknowledged as a person who can't claim any authority except he be sent by his master. Instead of assuming some role of importance, he does the lowliest thing that can be done. With all that knowledge, 
Now, you see the lesson that's in that for us. I believe a man that is really a man in this life, a woman that is really a woman, if they really have full confidence of their being sent from God, will not choose the most noble of assignments. For the most noble assignment is the the assignment that is lowliest. Jesus did precisely that. I am astonished that he would do such a thing. Peter was astonished too. And Peter wasn't going to cooperate until the master said, I won't have any part with you, Peter, unless I wash your feet. And of course, Peter got all flustered and decided that baptism, just do the whole thing, would be in order. Jesus wasn't talking about baptism. He wasn't talking about washing Peter's body. He says, you don't have any need of the body to be washed, but I'm to wash the feet. You see... I'm so astonished that his, and in his perfect manhood and in his tested manhood that he would choose the work of a slave. Could it be that there is a lesson in that for us? Doesn't it make sense that if we have confidence in our calling and that if we really know God, We'll not be seeking the more well thought of task. Tom England said that he was so blessed when I called him last night over a man who was interviewed on TV, I think, and he's a man that for 30 years has worked in the pit, in the pits uh, where the race cars make the pit stop. And for 30 years, he's changed the right front tire on racing cars. And for 30 years, he's tried to be the best right front tire changer in the whole world. For 30 years, he's worked with his timing. Not the left, not the left tire, not the back tires, but the right front tire. 30 years and he spoke with pride and he spoke with joy over the assignment that had been given him for 30 years. How appropriate that he's worked in the pits and he's worked at being the best right front tire changer that the world has ever known. Why well, sometimes it's those split, those split seconds that wins the race and loses it, the man at the right tire. Tom said he knew one thing, that a race car could not run without a right front tire. And if he didn't get that right front tire on there, there wouldn't be any race. Well, when Rod Taylor came to my office. He came as one of the brightest intellectuals that's ever I've ever met. He came at that time with a good education. He's near his doctor's degree now, but at that time he, he still was, uh, I think, either right at his master's or had received it. He came as a man with great ability. He had met the master And he came to test his manhood. And when we lifted our prayers to Jesus to find out what his assignment was, the Lord said he is to take care of, train, and um, teach 
these little children in daycare. The man that could teach a university, a man that could uh, run a corporation, a man that could do all this. The Lord said he's to start with daycare. And he's to continue. In many ways, our assignment never changes. Someone was so disturbed at me years ago because I, that my, my burden and my vision was that I wanted to carry Reverend Helm's bags. And I heard them say one day, I don't know who started this baggage thing. Well, I, I said I did. And I still believe that that's the vision. Because oftentimes I have seen that he has no one to carry his baggage still in this day. And oftentimes he and I have gotten a hold of both ends of the bags because both hearts are not right. And so it takes two men to keep one heart from from breaking, from collapsing. And that with carefulness. But the vision is still the same. Oh, God called me to preach along the way. God called me to do this and do that. But most of all, if you can get the symbolism of it, he called me to carry the baggage. And I'm so sorry that that person is disappointed with me. I'm so sorry that they're irritated over that. Years ago, someone who had helped carry the baggage said to me, Isn't it wonderful? I used to carry your baggage, and now someone's carrying baggage for us. I didn't say anything to him. He's not here anymore. But my thought was, my friend, if you, you can't stand it, but if I, could, if I could speak to your heart, I would like to tell you that that's something we never stop doing. We never stop carrying the baggage. It's a tremendous thing. And it cuts across the carnal nature. But that's exactly what you and I need. And that's what you and I need forever and forever and forever. And I don't think we can appreciate what Jesus has done till the carnal nature is slain. That it mattered not at all to him that he did the work of a slave. That he who was God in flesh. But in this perspective was the man who was the perfect man. Having been given now his freedom, his entire freedom under God, would take off his garments and do something that only slaves in the empire did. Jesus said, the man who is greatest is the man who serves. The story goes on, but let's just pick it up with the words of Jesus, for there's an admonition to us. Ye call me Master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, Ye also ought to wash one another's feet. I know there's symbolism of spiritual refreshment involved, but my friends, the, don't miss the primary meaning. The primary meaning is get the dirt off the feet. And Jesus refreshed them. He literally refreshed them by taking the dirt off their feet. This man who was perfect and now had permission to do exactly what he wanted to do. He said, all things are in your hands. So now he's free and takes off his garments and he gets the water and he gets down. And he does something that people don't like to do. And and no man with pride will do it. 
No man with pride would do. See, it's a lot different. Well, we do, we do that sometime when God leads. We used to do that in the denomination we were in. It was a wonderful ordinance. A lot of us had difficulty. I'm not so much worried about that. I'm not so much worried about the ordinance. But I, 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 I am concerned about the humility of heart because literally salvation is in the removing of dirt and doing the slave's job in the household of saints. You say salvation? Well, listen to what he said. Ye call me master and lord and you say well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. Now, there's a principle that says that I'll never be greater than Brother Ham. Nor will any man be greater than me than I have sent. No matter what he says. If I send him, he's not greater than me. And if I'm on bottom, we're just both sitting there. But I'm telling you something. I'll never be greater than Lauren Ham. He's certainly never as great. It'd be good for us to know what the good book says. The world knows we're harebrained fools. It's time we know about it. For what we say and we do and we act like. That's a strong word. But I mean that's the way the world feels about our cockiness. The world itself knows the value of humility. The world itself knows that men ought to be humble. Whether they are or whether they aren't, they know the value of it, at least to a measure. God wants us to know it. And he wants us to act accordingly. If ye know these things... Now, you want to know why you're not happy? Well, the answer is right here. Hear me because... My burden on the way to church was that I wasn't going to be heard and I knew full well. It wasn't very much possible that anybody was going to hear me. I I want to be heard. But you know something? I, I really don't have much push to try to get you to hear. But I do have one responsibility and that's to obey God. He said, if you know these things, happy... Are ye if you do them? Now, he didn't say, happy are ye if you know them. (laughs) He said, happy are ye if you do them. The reason we're not happy is we're not doing them. We're not doing the dirty work. We thought the happiness was in the beautiful work. No, the happiness is in the dirty work. The happiness is in the lowly work. The happiness is in is in the, the place of service. It's in the place where the world at large has disdain for what's being done. They don't want to do it, but they're not going to do it. But Jesus said, if you do these things, and if you know them, you've got to know, you can do them and not know them, that's misery. Because knowing is satisfaction. A man that knows his place, a man that has confidence in who he is and knows where he's come from and where he's going, it's all right, friend. You can't destroy him. I don't care how many ditches he digs. I don't care how many feet he washes. I don't care how many bags he carries. Brother, look at him. He's walking with pride. He's a man with his shoulders back. He's a man with confidence. And he's a man that has permission from God to do quite differently than what he's doing in a certain sense. Dan Light was a pastor of the Baptist Church in South Charleston. 
That's a prestigious church. He was also chairman of the American Baptists on the eastern seashore here. I'm told, and I'm told that she was the chairperson of uh, the women's uh, society. The women of the American Baptists. So they had the two highest positions on the east coast in the American Baptist church. But he had a sister who heard of another way. And somehow, in her love, she showed them the beautiful uh, way of washing feet. And one day, Dan and Jenny left everything and went to Muskegon to do that. Now, when you think about it, you think his denominations ever understood? it? No. Hardly anybody in there had ever said, why would this man leave such a prestigious place, the denomination of Martin Luther King? Why would a man leave that and leave a prestigious church like South Charleston and go to a no man's land and get involved in an independent work that has no connections and no way to bring you prestige and glory? Why would a man do that? Well, a man that wants to be happy will do that. (laughs) First of all, he knows He received knowledge that he was sent from God. And he knew where he was going. But he did more, he had more than the knowledge. I know a lot of people that know about this Christian walk, but they never take the first step. Whether they got it and they can get up and testify about it and they can write books on it, but they're not, they're not doing it. And if you check real closely, and if you're careful not to criticize, you'll find that they're not happy. There's no joy there. Because they're not doing these things. You know full well, my friends, that there's no problem down here at this end. There's not enough people down here. There's more feet here than you and I can wash. And there's so much room at the bottom. So many men want to do this and they want to do that and they want this and they want that. And everything that needs doing is wide open. There's not very much room at the top, but there's a whole lot of room at the bottom. (laughs) And Jesus said, happy if you're doing it. Happy you will be if you do it. So Dan took off from Muskegon and became the co-pastor of William McPhail. And God blessed. And they they had a wonderful ministry. They had a TV program. It didn't go because... Not because it wasn't good. It's hard to make a good thing go, especially if you're preaching self-denial on television. You watch how many of these programs would fold overnight if they they preach what the Bible's really preaching, what's really central. Brother, let me tell you something. Kaboom, they're gone. They tell me that Jack Ben Empey uh, got up and and told, uh, he discovered that he knew the whole Bible, knew the whole New Testament. He knew nothing whatsoever about love. And when God convicted him and it brought him low and he began to love and he began to preach this, his ministry folded. But I say it hasn't. Look out. He'll surface after a while. He tells people, I've done all these things. I've preached the gospel. I've done all this, but I've not loved everybody. I'm asking you to forgive me. His crowd's disappeared. There wasn't much of a crowd up here when he was here last time. Well, what's, what's different about Jack Ben Empey? Well, he's really, he's really sin of God with this kind. He has the knowledge of who he is. And he's now doing what Christ wants him to do. And what happens? The crowds are gone. They've disappeared. So Dan and Jenny go to Muskegon. And they have a successful ministry. But what's a reputation revival for a day? I mean, you know. President's not offering any of us any awards. No, I can't even, I don't even have a certificate of merit. I mean, if we get to the top, where is that? Who knows anything about it? Who's going to blow the trumpet? Brother, whatever is the top, you wouldn't know if you were there. And if you got there, you wouldn't get any awards for it. I'm speaking as far as this earth is concerned. Oh, no. 
You get in this ministry, and I want to tell you something. It's washing feet all the way. So they did in Muskegon. But some of us, after a while, get it in mind that there's a time in our life when washing feet is enough. I've had, I can just stand the smell so long. And we graduate. And there's when we graduate right out of our happiness. There's when we graduate right out of everything that brings the glory. There's when we graduate, brother, to what this world highly esteems. But if a man's listening to God, he may find that the commitment goes deeper. And so this week the Father has spoken. Dan and Jenny are leaving Muskegon. They're going to pastor a little fellowship in Owensville, Indiana, where there's not even enough to pray to pay the preacher's salary. Oh, you say, well, now, wait a minute. Ken's a multimillionaire. He's in Parker helping Brother Ham. Mama's on a retirement pay, and there isn't enough money to pay the salary. But that's where they'll be in three weeks. But the Bible says they're going to be happy. Amen. Let me sing. The Lord gives the best to those who give the best to Him. And if Kenneth and Mother have done anything, and Carol, they've done that. They've given the best to Jesus. And then I got word that Dan's going to have a little company. His brother, Johnny's going to go with him. Glory. <laughs> God will never leave you alone, I'll tell you. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. What is this song? Uh, yes, that's one we want right there. This song is, is entitled, The Morning Trumpet. Holy Spirit chose it. 